Sometimes the universe comes together in wonderful ways. When Carl Weathers walked onto screens in The Mandalorian, it was like a love letter to decades past for people of a certain age. At the same time, those people of a certain age were cheering on Rocky in the ring and seeing the brilliant metamorphosis of opponent-turned-friend Apollo Creed, they were also dreaming of hopping on a starship and heading off to a galaxy far, far away. The Mandalorian brought them together in a cosmic crash, and it was wonderful. Weathers spoke about his role as Grief Karga and acknowledged that it was a monumental task. It's tough because you've got a lot to live up to. You go into something that's so beloved around the world, and you realize people have so many strong opinions about what Star Wars really is. The first question was, how do we not screw this up? Even more exciting were hints that Weathers had big plans for his character, saying that given the chance, he would have loved to direct an entire movie centered around Karga as he took on Pirates and the Empire, and even to tell the story of a young Karga. Tragically, the veteran actor passed away on February 1st, 2024, before any of that came to fruition. In a tribute to this versatile actor who embodied one of the great characters of his era, let's take a look back at his off-screen struggles. Weathers may have played one of the great fighters of the silver screen, but off-screen, he was anything but a bare-knuckled troublemaker. He was born in Post, World War II New Orleans a city that had recently been a bustling hub of servicemen and celebration. But Weathers was honest about the challenges he faced. In 1979, Weathers described his neighborhood to the Washington Post, saying it had been a heavy-duty city when I was a kid. That was still the Deep South when I was growing up, and we were in the bowels of the city. I wasn't a fighter by nature. I held it all inside. It was not a happy time. In fact, when I'm feeling sorry for myself, I remember it as a perfectly miserable time. I think I was consciously trying to escape from a very early age. Always in love with the idea of acting and performing, Weathers said that he absolutely didn't fit in with the tough crowd that he grew up around. He always felt that he was on the outside, hiding who he really was. In the streets, they'll kill you, literally. It was my curse to be a sensitive kid. Even when he fell in with a friend group, Weathers said he was still very aware of the fact that he was incredibly naive and still on the outskirts, until he discovered football. The actor told the Washington Post that he initially got into playing football because he realized it was a great way to get girls' attention. When he discovered that he had an innate talent for it, it set him on a path out of New Orleans. It didn't go well, though, and his football career was fraught with injuries. Playing first for California's Long Beach City College, Weathers was training when he tripped and hurt his ankle so badly that it took him out of play for the rest of his freshman season. From there, he made his way to San Diego State, where he made the team but ended up warming the bench after a major knee injury. Dreams of playing in the NFL seemed to dwindle with each game he sat out, but he called in some favors. At the time, Sid Hall was the Oakland Raiders linebacker coach, and Weathers knew him from college. Hall got him a chance with the Raiders, and Weathers told Sports Illustrated that he knew he was way out of his league pretty much immediately. When he was cut, it was with a pointed admonishment from coach John Madden. He said to me, you're just too sensitive. What the F asterisk 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 do you mean I'm too sensitive? Not that it's not true. The actor was floored. I couldn't let it go, man. It kind of put a chip on my shoulder on one hand, and it was like a wound on the other. When he decided to channel his sensitivity into an acting career, he hit it big, literally. When actors stepped into the boxing ring for Rocky, let's be clear that there were some real hits flying. That's what makes it so bizarre that Carl Weathers suffered a life-altering injury not while filming Rocky, but on the set of Happy Gilmore. Happy Gilmore came out in 1996, and in 2020, Weathers sat down for an interview with GQ. He confirmed that shooting Rocky had been incredibly hard work and went on to say that he was still suffering from the Happy Gilmore injury. It happened, he explained, when he fell onto a stunt bag and got stuck between the bag and a wall. It hurt, but he didn't think much of it at the time and did the stunt a few more times. Years went by and Weathers said that it took him that long to get sick of the then constant pain. I fractured two vertebrae and osteophytes grew out and connected and it did a kind of self-fuse in a really bad place, 
he explained. There were three or four years there where I was just in excruciating pain. As if that wasn't bad enough, doctors told him that they couldn't operate to fix it, and he'd just have to stick it out. The worst of the pain eventually started to recede, and he said, I'm glad not to be experiencing what I was experiencing. It was debilitating. But that didn't mark the end of his troubles. In a career retrospective on Carl Weathers, Vulture suggested that his Apollo Creed should have been the real star of the Rocky films. They condemned white ethnic anxiety after the civil rights movement, as being partially to blame for the fact that Sylvester Stallone took off into the stratosphere while Weathers didn't. As for Weathers himself, he's acknowledged that he's faced some awful experiences with racism. The actor lent his voice to the audiobook for Pen Pal, Prison Letters from a Free Spirit on Slow Death Row, and in a 2020 conversation with Crime Story, he said that when he read the letters written by Tio Atala Salael, he immediately knew they needed to reach a larger audience. Weathers stressed that he wasn't against the judicial system, but he also said that he was troubled by the inequality that often played out in terms of treatment and sentencing. He went on to say that he didn't like the label of criminal, saying that it all too often leads to a lifetime stigma, and that was dangerous, particularly when it got applied to an innocent person. And he'd been there. I myself have never been in jail but I've certainly had too many occasions where the police, for whatever reason, seem to be motivated to approach me for one reason or another. And there, but for the grace of God, I could be another Tio. When the death of Carl Weathers was announced in 2024, the news was met with an outpouring of tributes, including a tearful one from Sylvester Stallone. In an Instagram post, Stallone spoke of the devastation that he was feeling, saying that he continued to credit Weathers for the success of Rocky. Stallone said, he was magic, and I was so fortunate to be part of his life. So Apollo, keep punching. According to the family's statement via the New York Times, Weathers died peacefully in his sleep. While there were no details immediately given, updates about some recent work seemed to suggest his passing was unexpected. Weathers was set to appear in a Super Bowl commercial for Fan Duel, alongside Rob Gronkowski. The company reached out to The Hollywood Reporter to say that they had been in touch with Weathers' family and added that while he would still be in the commercial, and the commercial would still air, changes had been made. The ads would be re-edited, but fans would get to see Weathers for one last time. A week after Weathers passed away, it was announced that the actor had heart disease, with his official cause of death listed as atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. The actor sadly died, leaving behind an incredible legacy built through a career spanning a little over five decades that saw him take on multiple iconic roles. Although the Rocky movie Apollo Creed is the role that defines Weathers' career, his work in film and TV has seen the actor portraying members of law enforcement, mentors to younger characters, and even space bounty hunters. The actor leaves behind movies and shows filled with hope, perseverance, and courageousness with many of his characters serving as a source of inspiration for multiple generations. In addition to the actor's prolific work as a character actor, Weathers directed two The Mandalorian episodes, Chapter 12, Siege, and Chapter 20, The Foundling, which perfectly demonstrated his creativity and love for the arts. Although many of his best movies and TV shows saw him take on more dramatic and action-based work, Weathers displayed great range with his work in comedies such as Happy Gilmore and Arrested Development. Not only did this demonstrate the actor's abilities beyond his usual work, but it also allowed him to inspire audiences not familiar with his action movies. One of Weathers' most prolific roles, state's attorney Mark Jeffries, appears in three different police procedurals, which not only demonstrates his importance to the Dick Wolf-created universe, but also displays the actor's affinity for the character. In a world filled with hot-headed cops and violent and cunning criminals, Mark's incorruptibility and firm belief that an effective prosecutor must be clear, concise, and honest in their work makes him a cut above the rest in a show filled with complexly written characters. Additionally, Mark continued Weathers' trend of playing respectable men. But that's not all. A sequel to the 1967 film of the same name directed by the late Norman Jewison in The Heat of the Night sees Weathers team up with venerated TV actor Carol O'Connor as Police Chief Hampton Forbes. 
Although Hampton didn't earn the title of police chief until after O'Connor's Bill Gillespie's retirement, the intuition, work ethic, and valor that Hampton displayed long before being promoted speaks to his pedigree as an agent of the law. Whereas Weathers' action career slowed in the 1990s, his other work, like In the Heat of the Night, better showcased his acting range. He also put a shift in the movie Hurricane Smith. Hurricane Smith sees Weathers as Billy Hurricane Smith, an oil field worker from Texas, journeying to Australia after his sister is kidnapped by members of organized crime. Although Hurricane Smith features its fair share of action scenes and set pieces, it is notable for seeing Weathers demonstrate more of his dramatic abilities, which required the material to focus less on the ballistic and explosive affairs of the 1980s in favor of something much more subdued. Despite not being as well known as some of Weathers' previous and future works, Hurricane Smith is one of his best action dramas. In the early 1990s, Weathers also starred in the TV show Street Justice. Street Justice centers around Weathers as Adam Boudreaux, a Vietnam veteran now working as a prolific police officer in the United States. While the TV, the series sees Weathers retreading familiar ground in the police procedural drama, it sets itself apart by its unlikely duo of Weathers and a young man from Canada working together to take down crime. Additionally, Weathers excels in the father-figure-like role of his younger partner, Grady, which helped solidify his image as one of the industry's best mentor figures. Despite not being as widespread, Adam marks a pivotal character in Weathers' career. Fast forward to 2019, Weathers excelled playing Combat Carl in the animation toy Troy 4. Arguably one of the best examples of Weathers displaying his comedic chops, Toy Story 4 sees Weathers as Combat Carl, a G.I. Joe-like toy that's just as brave and dutiful as he is hilarious. While Toy Story 4 is filled with many great characters, ranging from Woody to Buzz Lightyear to Keanu Reeves' Duke Kaboom, Combat Carl stands out because of his tongue-in-cheek style of humor that lovingly pokes fun at Weathers' career. From Rocky references to even more obvious Predator references, Combat Carl allowed Weathers to display a more fun side to the otherwise austere actor. Between 2019 and 2023, he also played the iconic Star Wars character Grief Karga in The Mandalorian. In what has become one of Weathers' most recognizable roles, the Mandalorian's Grief Karga is the leader of the Bounty Hunters Guild, an organization that assigns contracts to the galaxy's most prolific and deadly bounty hunters. As such, Grief is a self-preservationist at heart, typically avoiding developing emotional attachments to others. However, throughout The Mandalorian, Grief displays a warmer side to his character on rarer occasions, especially with Grogu. While the Grief is largely mysterious to everyone he interacts with, his strong character makes him an indelible part of the Mandalorian's cast. In addition to Weathers' superb work as Grief Karga, his commitment to the character and to the show at large afforded him the ability to retain a greater sense of creative control over the character. While mostly known in the show for his acting, Weathers' direction of two The Mandalorian episodes demonstrates perfectly the actor-director's commitment to the material given to him, assuming it's of a high standard. Not only were the episodes well-received, but they contributed to an even greater appreciation of Weathers' work as the dutiful, no-nonsense leader. Heading back, Weathers completely obliterated his role as Sergeant Jericho Jackson in the 1988 movie Action Jackson. Arguably one of the most underrated action movies from the 1980s, Action Jackson sees Weathers as the tough-as-nails Detroit, Michigan cop Jericho Action Jackson, as he takes on a ruthlessly power-hungry auto magnate with aims to eliminate all of his competition permanently. Rife with slow-motion action scenes, explosions, and the usual machismo that has sustained the action movie genre for decades, Action Jackson is distinct from its contemporaries in that it ostensibly features a black man in the lead role of what is quite possibly the most recognized genre worldwide. Action Jackson's distinction is important because the action movie genre in particular exemplifies a specific male fantasy that has worldwide appeal. While the Sylvester Stallone and Arnold Schwarzenegger action vehicles featured diverse casts of characters, Action Jackson was one of the first to demonstrate to the world that a black-led action movie could be just as viable as any other. Tough, determined, 
and maintaining a strong sense of honor and duty, Action Jackson is one of Weather's most important roles, as it helped carry the legacy of black exploitation era films like Shaft and Black Belt Jones into the modern age. And just a year before, the actor also starred as Colonel Al Dillon in the movie Predator. In one of Weather's most distinct roles, Predator's Colonel Al Dillon sees the actor as a hardened Vietnam War veteran who, along with his fellow brothers in arms, takes on a unique assignment that sees the men return to the jungle hell they'd just escaped to help take down an extraterrestrial threat. Filled with enough testosterone, guns, and attitude to sustain its feature-length runtime and jumpstart a franchise, Weathers' work as Al is brilliant because he helps subvert the popular action movie tropes that Weathers' mainstream career helped popularize in the first place. Whereas movies like Rocky and Action Jackson emphasize the aggro sensibilities that were incredibly popular in Hollywood during the 1980s, Predator proudly showcases the same sensibilities before pulling the rug from underneath its feet. Weathers' Al approaches the assignment with the arrogance and hubris that only a 1980s action movie character would, which effectively convinces the audience that taking down Predator will be light work. However, as Al and the audience soon discover, the reality couldn't be further from the truth, and Weathers' assured performance helps make the reveal more shocking. Last but not least, the celebrated actor will also be remembered for his work in the 1996 movie Happy Gilmore, where he played Derek Peterson. Arguably, Weathers' best mentor character, Derek Chubbs Peterson, is a former pro golfer who is forced into retirement after an alligator bites off his right hand. Despite his early retirement, Chubbs takes the tragedy as an opportunity to coach Adam Sandler's Happy Gilmore to victory in the film's Central Golf Tournament. Chubbs' sense of humor about his own tragedy, as well as his genuine mentorship of Happy, makes him an effective leader and a great character in Weathers' filmography. Through humor, Chubbs is able to rise above his shortcomings while helping Happy and the audience realize their potential in life. And finally, Weathers' role as Apollo Creed in the movie Rocky will go down in history as one of the best roles by a black man in Hollywood. Despite starting the Rocky franchise off as the main antagonist, Apollo Creed eventually becomes Rocky's greatest ally through his ability to humble himself and see a friend in a former foe. Not only does Weathers deliver the career-defining performance with the fervor and deftness necessary to sustain a franchise, but Weathers' Creed undergoes enough character development to make his character arc one of the most believable in Hollywood. Despite his death at the hands of Ivan Drago, Creed's infectious showmanship, boxing prowess, and rousing speeches make him an undeniable force in the franchise. Creed's determination to perform at his absolute best and rise to any occasion, irrespective of the challenges, inspired Rocky to become a better athlete and man and helped audiences reevaluate their feelings about themselves and their struggles. Apollo Creed, as well as the legacy of all other Carl Weathers characters, lives on thanks to the dedication and talent he would always put into his roles. In a career that included straight dramatic Hollywood roles and sitcom farce, Weathers was perhaps most closely associated with Creed, who made his first appearance as the cocky, undisputed heavyweight world champion in Rocky back in 1976. The film, a low-budget underdog drama written by and starring the largely unknown Sylvester Stallone, became an unexpected blockbuster, won the Oscar for Best Picture, and brought prominence to both actors. The Creed character appeared in the first four Rocky movies, dying in Rocky IV of 1984, while going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the hulking, steroid-using Soviet Ivan Drago, played by Dolph Lundgren. Before he entered the ring, James Brown sang Living in America with Showgirls, and Creed popped up on a balcony in a star-spangled banner shorts and waistcoat combo and an Uncle Sam hat, dancing and taunting Drago. A bloodied Creed collapses in the ring after taking a vicious beating, twitches, and is cradled by Rocky as he dies, inevitably setting up a fight between Drago and Rocky. But while Creed is gone, his character's son, Michael B. Jordan's Adonis Creed, would lead his own boxing trilogy starting in 2015. Seldom a critical favorite, although his muscular torso was much commented on by reviewers, Weathers took the view that his mission in show business was to entertain the masses. He told the Los Angeles Times after the release of Action Jackson, for the time being, 
Cars flipping in the air and assault rifles going off are what does it. Right now, the sun also rises or adaptations of Moliere don't do it. And it doesn't even matter what I think about it, in a sense. You have to give the people what they want. The actor introduced himself to another generation of viewers when he portrayed himself as an opportunistic and extremely thrifty actor who becomes involved with the dysfunctional clan at the heart of the sitcom Arrested Development, making a handful of guest appearances in 2004 and 2013. The Weathers character in Arrested Development likes to save money by making broth from discarded food. There's still plenty of meat on that bone, and baby, you got a stew going. And for the right price, agrees to become an acting coach for delusional and talent-free thespian Tobias Funky, played by David Cross. Weathers was born in New Orleans on January 14, 1948, and from childhood had dueling interests in athletics and acting. A defining moment of his young movie-going life was watching The Defiant Ones of 1958, starring Sidney Poitier and Tony Curtis as chain gang prisoners who escape while shackled together and must cooperate despite their racial animosity. Later, when Weathers had the clout and means to start his own production company, he remade it for TV in 1986, casting himself and Robert Urich in the leading roles. As mentioned earlier, Weathers played football on an athletic scholarship at San Diego State College, now university, while majoring in drama. Some of the guys thought I was this weird Jekyll and Hyde character because I was making this trek across campus to go put on tights and do Shakespeare, he told Entertainment Weekly. He had a brief pro football career with the Oakland Raiders and the British Columbia Lions of the Canadian Football League and finished his college degree in 1974 at what is now San Francisco State University. He then moved to Los Angeles and became a regular guest performer in shows including Good Times, the Six Million Dollar Man, and Barnaby Jones. Over the last decade, the entertainment industry has lost many pioneering black actors who were making significant contributions to the entertainment industry. Their skills graced both the film and the stage, bringing to life famous characters and tales that struck a deep chord with black audiences while also advancing on-screen representation and inclusion. Though they are no longer physically present, their legacy continues to inspire future generations of black performers and writers. Their work ranges from acclaimed dramas about the black experience to groundbreaking comedy performances and parts that redefine what a black leading man can be in Hollywood. One of such beloved stars is Chadwick Boseman, famous for bringing history to life with roles portraying iconic African Americans. Bozeman had the gifts and the drive that would take him from the halls of Howard University in Washington, D.C. and the British American Drama Academy in London to movie screens around the world. A native of Anderson, South Carolina, the son of a textile worker and a nurse, Bozeman graduated from Howard University in 2000, where he studied under celebrated actor and Howard graduate Felicia Rashad. He made film history portraying many of America's history makers, from Major League Baseball great Jackie Robinson to soul singer James Brown. But he found stardom with his role as T'Challa in Marvel's Black Panther, adding important representation to the Marvel Universe and the superhero film genre. His four-year battle with cancer is a testament to how much of a superhero he truly was. Bozeman filmed major Hollywood productions between cancer treatments and doctor's visits. His final film, an adaptation of playwright August Wilson's Ma Rainey's Black Bottom earned him an Academy Award nomination for Best Actor and a Golden Globe Award for Best Actor Motion Picture Drama. Bozeman died before filming started on the sequel, Wakanda Forever, in which the hidden African nation mourns the loss of their king and battles outside forces. Black Panther is the first superhero of African descent to appear in mainstream American comics, and the film itself is the first major cinematic production based on the character. Black Panther illustrates the progression of blacks in film, an industry that in the past has overlooked blacks or regulated them to flat, one-dimensional, and marginalized figures. The film, like a museum, provides a fuller story of black culture and identity. And then there is John Singleton. Singleton, the filmmaker behind Boys and the Hood, Poetic Justice, Baby Boy, higher learning, and more, died in April 2019 at the age of 51.
the first black man to be nominated for Best Director at the Academy Awards, and, at 24, the youngest person ever nominated in that category, he translated hip-hop sights and sounds to film, just as rap music was on the cusp of its crossover moment in the early 90s. In the words of frequent collaborator Ice Cube, he loved bringing the black experience to the world. Singleton brought to bear a sweeping and empathetic perspective on hip-hop culture from within the culture itself and relayed it to the masses, helping the music and messages reach communities they might not have otherwise. He offered many of the first coming-of-age stories rooted in black experience to break through into the white American cultural mainstream. Because they were often set in the 90s in his hometown of Los Angeles, that experience was quintessentially hip-hop. He was an originator of hood cinema, which told stories of the black working class from all angles. To that end, Singleton gave rappers like Ice Cube, Q-Tip, Busta Rhymes, and Ludacris their first major roles in movies, in addition to Tupac Shakur, Snoop Dogg, and Andre 3000. He also put his house up as collateral to finance 2005's Hustle and Flow, a film about the rap grind that won 3-6 Mafia an Oscar for Best Original Song. Singleton was a noted lover of rap, and he understood its intrinsic relationship to a particularly modern black storytelling experience. He was MC Ren's choice to direct an N.W.A. biopic, and he exited the Tupac biopic because the producers didn't think of the story as a cultural event. Speaking about N.W.A.'s Straight Outta Compton for the album's 30th anniversary, Singleton said he considered the album foundational, the first hood cinema. You got to remember... Then we didn't have no movies, he recalled. We listened to albums like they were movies. As a result, Singleton was the first director to film The Hood as rappers were depicting it in their music. Do the right things Radio Rahim blasted public enemies fight the power out of his boombox as a symbol of black protest, but Boys End The Hood's Doughboy Ricky and Trey were living out the lyrics of N.W.A. songs. Doughboy dressed and talked like Ice Cube because that's who played him. The music and the movies shared iconography. The characters weren't living in a world adjacent to hip-hop. Hip-hop was at its core. Rap was playing at their barbecues, their dorm parties. Boys End the Hood quickly led to similar hip-hop films like Juice and South Central of 1992 and Menace to Society of 1993. F. Gary Gray pushed the perspective even further with Friday in 1995 and set it off in 1996. Video director Hype Williams put Nas and DMX in front of the camera for their first feature in Belly later in 1998. By 2005, there was Hustle and Flow. By 2015, there was Dope. Singleton kicked open a door, and new generations continued to charge through it, kicking down new ones. Boys End the Hood will be remembered as Singleton's masterwork, but he continued to make space for a multitude of black characters and their stories— the rappers who would portray them throughout the 90s and into the 2000s. Poetic Justice, starring Janet Jackson and Tupac as a poet and a would-be musician, respectively, was a cult hit that earned Jackson an Academy Award nomination for Best Original Song. His 2003 The Fast and the Furious sequel, Too Fast, Too Furious, which introduced Tyrese and Luda to a universe in the making, helped diversify what has become a billion-dollar franchise. More recently, he had moved into TV as the creator of Snowfall, which explored the crack epidemic in Los Angeles. Nearly 30 years later, rappers are still paying tribute to Singleton's vision. And lastly, there is Sidney Poitier. In January 2022, the world stood still as we learned that renowned actor Sidney Poitier passed away at 94 years old. But his passing is important not only to cinephiles, but to anyone interested in grasping the arc of social change in the United States over the last 75 years. A pioneering black actor, Poitier's acting career broke significant barriers in entertainment through a series of singular performances. But his social impact reflects more than just his acting chops. Poitier was both an actor and an activist and despite a mixed array of perspectives over the years on the ways that he represented black people in film, he undoubtedly played a leading role in African Americans' fight for civil rights and more positive media representations from the silver screen to the streets. In 1963, the same year that Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. delivered his iconic I Have a Dream speech at the March on Washington, a related dream long held by black performers was realized. 
Poitier became the first black actor to receive an Academy Award for Best Actor for his portrayal of Homer Smith in the film Lilies of the Field. Though this may seem like an insignificant milestone, social and political conditions in 1963 were such that this outcome was genuinely remarkable. From the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing and the violent riots that followed to the killing of NAACP Field Secretary Medgar Evers, this was a period of considerable and ongoing anti-black violence, even as it was met with black resistance and mass mobilization beyond the black community alone. It was not until the following year that the 24th Amendment was passed, thus abolishing poll taxes that had long disenfranchised black voters, and that President Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964 into law, which outlawed segregation of public facilities and employment. In this social and cultural landscape, seeing a black man be recognized for his skills as an actor in a dignified role, and not in a minstrel show or some other degrading spectacle, was significant and is remembered as a watershed moment in evolving the nation's ongoing conversation about race. American audiences would become even more closely acquainted with Poitier when he portrayed Detective Virgil Tibbs in In the Heat of the Night, followed by John Prentice in Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, both released in 1967. Laying bare some of the most fundamental racial anxieties that prevailed during the era, Poitier's performances provided abundant fodder for discussion and represented black men in ways that defied racist tropes and stereotypes, opting for a demeanor that responded to prejudicial treatment with an unflappably peaceful demeanor. With Poitier opening the way for black actors, black actors like Bozeman and Weathers followed suit, leaving a legacy that is nothing short of admirable. Alongside Weathers, Bozeman, and Potier, special mentions go to the likes of John Witherspoon, Michael K. Williams, Bernie Casey, and Bernie Mac, among others, who have since transitioned to the afterlife. That said, tell us, what was your favorite Carl Weathers movie? Let us know in the comment section below. And that's it from us today until next time. Thank you for watching.